this week on the Mindful Men podcast. Before I get into compassion-focused therapy, you said that you went through a few definitions about what compassion actually is. So can you Mm. highlight for us what you think compassion is and why is this important? Yeah, it is an interesting area because there are different schools of thought, I suppose, in terms of what compassion is. But when you kind of sort of bring it all down to its fundamentals, I I guess a, a good definition is compassion is a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it. Actually, you can sort of sense there's those two components there of compassion. There's what they call compassionate engagement, which is the sensitivity, the awareness, the noticing of suffering in self and others. So right in the definition, actually, it includes ourselves. So that's Mm. sort of important. And then the second half is what they think of as compassionate action, which itself is a motivation or a commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it because it's not always easy to take suffering away. But we have this commitment to try to, to, to make efforts to wisely try to alleviate suffering. I wanted to jump in there. Like, what is suffering then? Because everyone has different ideas about what suffering is. And I, I put this in the same basket as trauma. For some people to, to think that, oh, yeah, I've had a traumatic experience or I'm suffering, it has to be really profound. Whereas other people can, can go, no, it can actually be quite small. How would you define suffering, I guess, to a bigger extent, trauma as well? You know, kind of suffering is a part of life, really, <laughs> isn't it? Which is somewhat disappointing thought, but that's the reality of it. And I, I do feel like suffering can certainly be experienced at different levels and, and at different extents. You know, in a, in a way, when I was off for my walk this morning, I'm, I'm sort of noticing a niggling pain. And so in a sense, that's suffering. It's not the worst thing in the world, of course. But, you know, suffering to me is that kind of discomfort, disappointment, pain, trauma, and so on. But I think the other thing that's really important about suffering is how we then respond within ourselves to those disappointments, discomforts, pain, and so on. And so I noticed my mind picking up on this little pain in the toe and thinking to myself, ah, shit, you know, this is going to get worse. I'm not going to be able to walk. What am I meant to do at my age to exercise? How am I supposed to keep fit? You know, I'm I'm already getting checks on my heart and, you know, like now I'm not going to be able to walk again and so on, so on, you know, just sort of went on and on. And so there's a sort of a Buddhist parable, I think, which is the two arrows of suffering. You know, the first arrow is the very natural discomfort and pain and suffering that we experience in life. And then the second arrow is how we respond or interpret or relate to our own suffering. It's tricky. There are things we can do for that first arrow, but I suppose CFT and and the compassion that we might bring to ourselves really starts to relate to that second arrow as well. A bit like self-criticism. That would be an example of the second arrow. It's hard enough running a business, trying to grow it, doing all of the stuff that you're needing to do. But then to add self-criticism to that just kind of compounds the whole thing. Yeah, and that self-criticism can stop us in our tracks. It stops us taking risks for the reward or trying new things or doing things a little bit differently. And then we get stuck in a bit of a rut. And I guess this is where maybe we need to start showing more self-compassion because we get stuck in that loop, that negative loop, where it just goes Mm. on and on and on. And this is maybe where therapy can help to stop going through the loop and start ironing it out and seeing it for what it is. What you're saying, it sounds much like acceptance and commitment therapy. So the acknowledging stuff, it's the accepting stuff, and then it's the committed action stuff as well. It sounds very similar. Yeah, sometimes CFT gets referred to as one of the third wave cognitive behavioural therapies. The founder of CFT is a guy called Professor Paul Gilbert. And, you know, sometimes he balks at that idea. He he sort of doesn't feel it it is exactly a third wave therapy. He might say that it really is an integrated model. He, He draws upon sort of In particular, evolutionary theory is at the heart of CFT, really trying to understand our tricky brains, as he would say it. You know, we we have tricky brains. He does it in a Derby accent, but they're brains that have evolved over all of that time to help us to survive and so on. And this is the funny thing. Self-criticism itself is an evolved function of the brain that you can perhaps imagine the primitive human who desperately needs to be part of the group. You know, that's key for our survival. If we're kicked out of the group, we're dead, basically. So we need to stay in the group. So we evolved to be very good at kind of monitoring 
our place in the group, our value, our worth. And we evolved in some ways to feel this kind of uh, tendency to be unworthy in the group. Because if we sort of lean towards a kind of an unworthiness, that would motivate us to try harder and to do better and to be of more value to the group and therefore more safely in the group. So self-criticism is kind of an evolved part of the tricky brain. And, and actually a lot of people hold on sort of tightly to their self-criticism. You know, they feel that I don't want to be lax or lazy. I, I don't want to fail and so on. And so they feel like self-criticism is the thing that's going to keep them going and, and make them successful and, and that sort of thing. It's interesting because when you really look at the effect of self-criticism, there's a big relationship between self-criticism and depression and mm -hmm. self-criticism and less motivation and so on. But that can often be a block for people. They worry about losing their self-criticism. They worry about this will make them a failure and unworthy and no good. And so they resist self-compassion. They worry that self-compassion is going to take them in the wrong direction. As you're talking about that, two things came to mind. One is you were talking about the primitive human. And mm -hmm. as you were saying that, it felt like you were saying the birth of social constructs about what it means to be a man and a woman or non-binary or whatever. And for guys particularly, and I've experienced this myself, is we are self-critical to the sense of, am I being a boy or a man? Am I tough enough? Am I strong enough? Am I able to fix things? Can I get through this without having to ask for help? On the flip side of that, I was also thinking about perfectionism. And so we're super self-critical because we want to be seen as perfect. But then once things aren't perfect, things can really unravel. We can either blow up like a volcano. We can get on the drugs, the alcohol, try to self-soothe, all these types of things. How connected is this with masculinity? and what guys go through in terms of their self-identity or maybe they've had a relationship breakdown or something's happened at work, they lost their job. Talk us through your experience with working with guys in this space. There is a, a sense that men, and myself included, we don't like vulnerability. We like to feel strong. And I remember working with a group of veterans. We ran a compassion-focused therapy group, and the common refrain really from them was, it sounds too much like self-pity, mm. and that's the last thing. I want is to be self-pitying. Often men can balk at this idea of self-pity or self-indulgence or being soft or weak. And also the other bit you picked up on is how am I being seen in the minds of others? That's a very difficult one. We don't want to be seen in the minds of others as inadequate or inferior, no good. Shame is a very critical aspect of this, that sort of sense of external shame, which is where the, the other people see us as no good and, and so on, and then leading to internal shame, which is our own sense of ourselves as, as no good. And so often men will try to find some ways to feel stronger again or energised or feel like they're not losing status in the group. Anger is potentially a part of that mix, becoming more angry or more aggressive or externalizing of blame. And then we, we get into this big vicious cycle then because perhaps we do get a bit angry or let off a bit of steam or something like that. And all of a sudden people around us are saying, see, you are a bad person or whatever. And then the shame kicks back in and, and we're, we're caught in this very difficult, vicious cycle. I can imagine when you're sitting in clinic or in a session and you start to out of the words compassion and things like this some of the guys might be like whoa what are we about to dive into here because i have the same when i talk to guys about mindfulness <laughs> it's like oh that sounds a bit woo woo or hippie or whatever how do you navigate a guy starting to look at compassion as a process and as a therapy tool this is really great because one of the things paul gilbert identified early on is that in cft the first and foremost, we're trying to work with what he calls fears, blocks and resistances to compassion. So that, that's a key thing. And it's an important thing to, to mention, because if anyone is listening and they're, they're sort of noticing these fears, blocks and resistances arise to the word compassion or, or, or self-compassion. Well, well, that's actually very normal. You know, like all of us have reservations about this thing, you know, and, and often it can be really to do with our sense of what compassion is 
even means. If a man thinks about compassion and the way they relate to it is that it is soft and gentle and sort of loving and cuddly and soft voices and things like that, they might think, well, you know, it's dog eat dog out there, you know, like I got to be tougher than that sort of a thing. And so one of the things we really try to kind of break down is what is compassion or what are the qualities of compassion? In CFT, we're actually emphasizing things like wisdom, strength, courage, a commitment to being helpful. I mean, sometimes if it's in the middle of the night and your little baby is sick or something like that and, and crying, and most men would go in and sort of give them a pat or a cuddle and soft tones and it'll be okay, you'll be all right, let's, let's just get back to sleep or something like that. But if your child is reaching for a boiling pot of water and you can see that disaster is about to happen, it's kind of like, no, 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 don't, stop, stop. You might even give them quite a fright. But that's compassionate still. Compassion is about being aware of suffering and doing something to alleviate it. And often strength and courage are the key to doing that. So I think that's really a big one for people to explore. They'll have these little blocks to compassion and self-compassion. So let's start by thinking what we really mean by that and really focusing in on wisdom, but strength and courage and commitment to being helpful. I love those words, strength and courage. I'm often talking to the guys that I work with about resilience. And they're like, I'm not a resilient person. And I see being strong and courageous is tuning into your resilience. All the times you've been knocked down before and you've got up and you've gone again and you keep doing this or you keep rocking up to therapy even though you don't know what to talk about <laughs> or the update is, oh, it's the same old, same old. But this mm -hmm. is resilience. This is building up more strength and, and more tools for your mental health toolkit or, or however you want to describe it. So you've started talking about compassion and these other buzzwords as well. Talk us through how you w navigate that into a session. How do you work with guys and start developing their self-compassion as well? Well, actually, step one really is to bring it back to the body a little bit. You know, that I think you've probably found as well that, that you know, sort of therapy and, and working with people really has move towards a kind of body-based aspect to it, you know, trying to cultivate that sense of strength and courage, but groundedness, stability, calmness in the body. And so we often would begin there, you know, we start to, to think about various practices. Mindfulness might come into that, actually, because compassion is about sensitivity and awareness. And so we cultivate mindfulness, we might use certain body posture, facial expression, voice tone, inner voice tone, and breathing practices to kind of really create that in the body. The next thing we might try to do is really have a sense of how to feel safe. Because quite often men are in a situation where they're largely threat system activated a lot of the time. There are social threats, sometimes there are physical threats or emotional threats. And so they're kind of threat system activated, fight, flight, freeze. And so using imagery, techniques to start to remember what it feels like to feel safe. We might use imagery of, of a safe place, for example, or we might start to use imagery of the person in their life with whom they felt safe, a teacher or a coach or a relative or a friend, and start to build some of that into the imagery. And then we start to think, okay, so what are some memories of what it feels like either to be compassionate or to receive compassion or maybe even to witness an act of compassion because we're then wanting to sort of start to get some clues about, you know, just what that might look and feel like so that we can then start to sort of enact that a little bit, you know, cultivate that part of ourselves that really is compassionate because compassion evolved too, you know, like our tricky brain evolved. But so did our compassion as a human kind of quality. So really trying to tap into that, embody that compassionate part of ourselves and then start to direct it, you know, maybe to others, but also to ourselves. Just a last little example. I was working with a man just yesterday and we were talking about self-compassion and he was like, WTF, you know, kind of thing, <laughs> trying to work out what on, on earth I was on about. And I, we used this little notion of, okay, you, let's say you're walking along the beach and you kind of stumble across a turtle that's stranded on the beach, wrapped up in fishing line, suffering in a sense. You know, what do you do? And he said, well, I'd go over, I'd try to work this out. I'd, I'd maybe get some scissors and cut the line off and 
and I'd do something, you know, to help it. And then I said, it's funny, like, just imagine what sort of things would you be saying to this turtle? I know it's a turtle, it <laughs> can't speak, but it's a bit with our pets, we talk to them sometimes. And, and he goes, oh, I'd probably be saying, you know, you'll be right, mate, I got you, steady, steady on, you know, we can get through this, here you go, you'll be right. And I'm like, that's compassion. Now, not only is that compassion, but self-compassion is just when you're the one walking along the beach and you're the turtle caught up in that fishing line. It's just about identifying our own suffering, doing something to help, and often coming along with that kind of, you know, sort of reassuring, encouraging, supportive, helpful voice tone, saying little things to ourselves that just keep us going. I really love that example. I'm interested with the the, the work that you do with guys. Is there like certain guys that this works well with? Are there certain guys that this doesn't work well with? I, I think that there's bit of an assumption sometimes that I notice amongst therapists that men won't like it as much or mm. something. And sometimes people even feel like they need to shy away from the word compassion because they're worried that if they use words like that, that somehow <coughs> men won't really relate to it or won't be of interest. But to be honest, I don't feel that way. I think on an individual basis, there are some people who are potentially less kind of interested in this approach. But I'm not sure that there are sort of groups of men or men in general or that sort of thing that that are just kind of somehow categorically not suited to it. I have worked in a compassion-focused way with some men who have pretty rugged backgrounds, you know, as I say, military people, police officers, lawyers. I can think of a lawyer recently who he was a bit like you described, the alcohol was really a key part of his coping. But it was about threat as well, now that I'm thinking out loud, because I remember he said to me something like, I don't mind about the opposition lawyers or, or the opposition clients. You know, I'm like, I'm not worried about them. I'm not worried about the courts or that sort of thing. My biggest threat is the guy in the next office because he's competing with me. He's trying to get my clients or whatever. And I thought, wow, oh, you know, that's tough. That basically your own group is where the, the actual threats are coming from. And so, yeah, alcohol became a part for her kind of managing threat and that sort of thing. But if you pitch it right, if you kind of spend enough time just exploring this word, acknowledging and accepting that there will be some blocks, exploring it further, starting to kind of get a real sense of the definition and how to interpret it and what it involves, especially when we drill down to wisdom, strength and courage, I think a lot of people can take that on board. If you think about compassionate action, like your decision to stop drinking, I mean, maybe sometimes compassion is sort of curling up under a blankie and eating ice cream and watching <laughs> Netflix. That might be compassion sometimes. But often self-compassion is the much tougher road. It, it's the road that we need to take because we wisely know that it's in our best interest in terms of our health and well-being bit like me and my walking too, you know, or for me at the moment, like I got to get my taxes done because I lie awake at night worrying about that and then get up the next morning and don't quite do it. But it would be a self-compassionate action actually to get those taxes done and submitted because it would mean less suffering for me, less anxiety, less worry, fewer emails from my accountant. So often self-compassion is the tougher choices, the tougher road, but in the service of, of health and well-being. 